I'm rather incoherent, and today I would like to talk about my three favorite investigators in Arkham Horror. Generally speaking, I optimize, I'm a min maxer, and I enjoy things that are powerful, and you're gonna see a fair bit of that in the list. Parallel Skids is, in my opinion, the weakest character you'll be seeing today. But that's not to say that Parallel Skids is weak, in fact, he's quite strong, despite the fact that he's still wearing Skids' original terrible stat line. His ability is insane. At first, it doesn't seem that great. You test a value of 3 against a difficulty 1, 2, or 3, depending on how many resources you invest. And say you bet one resource, you get two back, two resources, three. So the harder the test, the more money you make. And on standard difficulty, you can pretty safely just test one to three and be up to, and you'll basically be J. But it's when you start doing other things that it starts getting much more powerful. The ability to interact with his ability using skills allows you to do things like use watch this to bet double and increase your odds of winning, manual dexterity becoming emergency cash level two, quick thinking giving you actions to use certain savant just being an emergency cash, Things like Hard Knocks just get used every round, guaranteed to make money. Well Connected becomes Recursive Emergency Cash. This is the best big money deck there is in terms of enabling big money. And you'll notice that I've cut false the end bargain. You just don't need it. You'll still have way too much money by the end of it. And this is a pretty typical big money asset pile. Switchblade, Black Band, Haste, Leo, Lonnie and Trench Cut to be Invincible, Lucky Cigarette to Droll, Dirty Fighting for Actions, and Plus Fist, Eos for Stats, and then Well Connected. Hard Knocks is the only thing even a little bit out of place here, but Paradox Kids does something unique with this. He has a 25 card deck, and then he gets to take Underworld Support to drop it down to 20, and he has a lot more consistency than most other people would with the same deck size. Especially, one thing that works better for him than anyone else that's not immediately obvious, a draw action on Parallel Skids is better than it is on other characters, because the odds of it hitting what you need are better. So even though he doesn't have that much draw, he also doesn't need nearly as much as most other characters, and the ability to use something like manual decks very frequently is very nice. And I do mean frequently, because since you test all the time, you'll see a star quite frequently. Perilous Gets also has a really good star effect. You get a level 2 or lower card from your discard pile back to your hand, and that's pretty much every event and skill in the deck, and all of them are really good and immediately do valuable stuff pretty fast. Skids has a really good ability now, a really good star. His smaller deck is very nice, and his card pool does get him lucky, and lucky is really good for allowing you to play greedily. As an example with lucky, you can pretty regularly be like, I'm going to test with manual decks and only be up three. And you would normally be terrified of getting a minus war, but as long as you have this lucky in your hand, you're safe. You don't have to invest more money by spending a resource on hard knocks to make sure you pass, because you have lucky, you're going to be fine. Lucky is secretly one of the best cards in the deck, and this is just the big money stuff, right? It's just doing the big money stuff as quickly as possible with as small of a deck as it can get, and then it's doing some really intricate stuff on top of it. The coolest thing by far that you get to do in Parallel Skids is his ability to gamble is a lightning bolt. It's not just during your turn as a fast action. You can do it in any player window, and most importantly, the Luke Robinson window. When I say the Luke Robinson window, I mean the one where during the enemy phase, hunters move, and then they attack. So what you can do as Luke is you walk to a location with no one else, hunters come to your location, they engage you, and then before they attack you, you go to your happy place, you run away and they can't hit you. With Parallel Skids, you can gamble and commit quick thinking, get an action before they can hit you, and then it's pretty easy to make that a pass, you have well connected. You can trip them, use dirty fighting and punch them, so instead of them hitting you, it goes the other way. It is a gamble, absolutely. There is a risk you auto fail and things don't go according to plan, and that's just really appropriate thematically. Parallel Skids is a really concise, efficient deck, it has a very clear goal, it plays very smooth, there's a lot of little intricacies you get to do with his ability, he's very fun to play, and I really like Parallel Skids, he is very easily my favorite rogue. Coming over to my number two, it's Luke Robinson. Luke is just a really strong character. Seeker Mystic is an incredibly powerful combination, the reason for that is Mystic is generally held back. The core idea of a Mystic is super efficient, your head is your only stat, it's a Mythos Resilient stat, and now you get to use it proactively. The downsides that keep Mystics from dominating the game are that Mystics as a class have no mobility, no draw, and no economy. Well, that's not true. They have almost none of all of those things, with the exception of Scroll of Secrets and Uncage the Soul, nothing good for any of them. It turns out Seekers are great at those three things, though, and Luke is the best at mobility. So Luke Robinson uniquely negates every single weakness of being a Mystic. In fact, he's so good at draw, that he can run decks no one else can. He can use Mr. Rook to reliably get True Magic into play, Research Librarian is helping with that, get Twyla as well, and the assets he needs, so that he can actually run a two spells per turn forever deck that's just like super efficient. He can play a flex character that can do anything that never runs out of steam, 
virtually unkillable, best mobility in the game. He is just, in terms of raw, straightforward efficiency, I think he's the best flex in the game. Harvey might get a little bit close, but that's really just because of a cult lexicon. Luke is much more actually a flex and not just a one card being broken. And by the way, Harvey was actually the number four, Skids beat him out, but if this were a top five, Harvey would have been here. I don't really have a lot more to say about Luke. Theoretically, he has a bunch of other builds you can run on him, but I'm not the kind of person to be interested in not running True Magic when given the chance. True Magic is the kind of card that just fires all the right neurons in my brain. I'm like, oh yes, that's amazing. How do we make that happen? I just need to do that and nothing but that. And no other mystic gets to, it's why I like Luke so much. He's not just the mystic that negates every mystic weakness, he's the only one that gets to build a reliable, competent True Magic deck. Except for maybe Jim. Jim can run some of these yellow cards and do something kind of similar, but, you know, he's Jim, and he wouldn't have this sort of mobility. So, yeah, Luke, very, very fun, easily my favorite mystic. And then we come to my number one. It's the character that I view as being the most like a competitive deck in an online card game, right? If you were playing Hearthstone and picking the cards in your deck to do a specific strategy and win by doing a specific thing, Mark Harrigan is what reminds me of that deck more than anything else. Mark Harrigan feels like I made a competitive deck for Constructed in an online card game. The deck is just like single-minded and stupidly efficient. And if you haven't seen me talk about this Mark deck before, I did a playtest of this alongside Taboo to Mandy back before I realized I could run Bestow Resolve and make it even more disgusting. The deck's pretty straightforward. Mark has the best draw engine of anyone in the game. He just gets an extra card every turn like Harvey, but there's a little bit of a hoop to jump through. In addition, you just run all of the neutral skills, guts, and manual decks, plus your ability to use Sophie. It means you test at 7, you're immune to the Mythos phase, unless you auto-fail, you're going to pass. In addition, you're going to draw two cards when you do that. Overpower, when you hit, allows you to draw a card. Perception, you can cycle on somebody else. But Overpower and Perception both get much better when you have Bestow Resolve. So now you can commit guts and Overpower to that head test and test at, you know, 9. <laughs> At this point, you're just beating the test on, like, expert difficulty, it's getting stupid. But what's really busted about this is that a timing window that I might just need to make a short about, because I don't think people understand the game works this way, I certainly didn't. You aren't allowed to commit more than one card to somebody's skill test. You're not allowed to commit them normally, that's the issue. There's a specific part of the skill test timing window where other players at your location may give you one card. However, that's just one card during that specific step. If a Lightning Bolt or another card commits something outside of that, that's allowed. So, Lightning Bolt during a skill test performed by an investigator at your location or connecting location, spend a charge? That is not normal. Somebody at a connecting location can be taking a foot test with one foot. Like, let's say you're in a four-player team and there's a Leo there. You're like, oh, I'm gonna fail this. You're like, nah, nah, I spent three charges on Bestow Resolve. Manual decks overpower perception. You have plus six. You can do that. That's how this card works. I don't know if that's the intention or just like a weird workaround in the rules, but it's really important to bestow resolve being crazy because it gives you a crazy, crazy amount of team support to be able to give anyone on any test plus two, quite often plus four with only one charge spent from this, unless they're at a different location. But I mean, most people aren't even protecting people at different locations. Speaking of team support, you've got Howard, Mirror, and Tetsuo Amori. They're not allowed to die, and healing yourself won't be a problem either. This deck cycles insanely fast. It's got two copies of Second Wind, three copies of Soothing Melody, two copies of Tetsuo. You should be able to keep yourself up and going with no issues. And like, I guess you do need to move. We'll draw a Safeguard pretty fast. The deck cycles insanely quickly. Flamethrower kills everyone, and when you're cycling your deck this fast, like, I don't know how many extra ammos you need, but you've got enough of them. And then we have Stand Together for more team support. We have the basic stick the plan set up, Emergency Cash, Ever Vigilant. I put Shortcut under there as my last one, because Shortcut is just a busted card. I would hold Shortcut in my hand forever, just in case I needed it later, like an elixir in Final Fantasy, because this thing is ridiculous. Shortcut allows you to fix problems that no other game and no other card in the game can. It's the only way in the entire game to move someone else outside of their turn. Shortcut's just nuts. You'll notice it's the only tactic I'm running. I'm not running like winging it with the ability to commit all this and test at high numbers. I'm not running like practice makes perfect and the actual practice skills. Right now, the only practice skill is overpower my signature. There are other good cards, 
but it's really hard to fit all the bestow resolve nonsense in alongside the rest of this. I really value the team support. Flamethrowers are not optional. Stick to the plan is not optional. Honestly, with this much draw, maybe stick to the plan is optional. Oh, also, we run Brandica Thugga. There are two reasons for this. First, we actually need an arcane asset. That way we can overwrite our empty bestow resolve and then draw it again in the second cycle. That's very important. The second thing is that Brandica Thugga allows you to attack over something you cannot do with Flamethrower. Flamethrower can only attack engaged enemies. It can't shoot over. And then in addition, Brandica Thugga, this is up for debate. Reddit thread about it. Massively ambiguous in the community, like 55, 45 across 500 votes. We're not sure if Brandica Thugga deals one damage or zero on a miss. But either way, since you're shooting for two, that's still better than normal. So Brandon Kathaga synergizes really nicely with Flamethrower, which is the best weapon in the game for killing, which you'll have infinite bullets for because you cycle so fast. Best team support in the game because you have so many copies of Stand Together too. It's just gross. I didn't really get how broken Mark was until I evaded Hoster the first time with Daring and Manual decks at eight. And I was like, oh, wait, I can do anything. And then I found out about Bestow Resolve and the deck got even more optimized. Mark Harrigan doesn't feel like an Arkham Horror character. He feels like a competitive deck. I feel like I'm going to go play in Legend Ranks on the ladder right now looking at this. But instead, I'm going to walk into a one-sided PvE game and there is a nothing it can throw at this deck that will remotely trouble it. This deck is ridiculous. And to some degree, it's a Mark as a whole, but it's this specific, super high cycle style of Mark where you, the draw engine creates infinite ammo. It creates huge amounts of team utility. You're basically invincible because of how it mirrors and second wins. It's a really, really strong deck. And it's the sort of streamlined, efficient thing that I really want to get every character to do. But very few come anywhere near the degree that Mark does. This is, there's nothing in this deck that's not doing the goal, right? Committing skills to draw cards, killing, healing, healing, killing, moving so I can kill more, economy, killing, healing, moving so I can kill more, economy, drawling. Like, it's just disgusting. The deck is so single-minded and inefficient, and there's there's nothing in the deck that's, like, expensive or hard, right? Mark's so good that you can upgrade this deck in any order. You can get Stand Together Level 2 as your first upgrade if you want, or sorry, Stand Together Level 3. It doesn't matter what upgrade path you take, Mark's gonna be fine. The worst part of Mark is that he's, like, the only character in the game that can't actually take in the thick of it and feel good about it. But even then, you could take in the thick of it on the argument that now it's okay to play second wind earlier. You shouldn't, but it's funny. That's gonna be it for now, though. I still really enjoy Parallel Skids for being the character that most smoothly plays the deck I've played the most. Luke is just such an, like, subversion of all the mystic weaknesses and he plays so differently from all the others. And then Mark is just brutally efficient. And for those reasons, they are my favorite characters. It's not just how strong they are. I don't think Luke or Mark are even in the top five characters. I don't think Parallel Skids is even in the top 15. I do find myself attracted to stronger characters more, but it's the way these characters are strong that is what really draws them. I find them much more interesting than something like a Clue Dropper Daryl or a Big Money Tony. Even though this is just like, objectively, the bargain bin at Tony, right? Like Tony runs the same list and just does it better but I don't care about that. I like Parallel Skids more. Anyways, I've been rather incoherent. I'd love to hear about your favorite characters down in the comments or why you think these characters are trash if you do, and I'll see you in the next one.